so he, he decided to, to come to Manitoba uh, with, uh, and, and see what he could find um, in 1944. He got a few odd jobs working on farms and, and, and factories and things like this in, um, in Winnipeg in, in 1944. And then, of course, the war ends in 1945. And Tack realizes he doesn't want to be a laborer for the rest of his life. And he needs to, he needs to do something else with his, with his life. And by some extraordinary turn of events, he discovered that the Winnipeg School of Art did not require high school graduation to let him into the school. And as a consequence, he went to the Winnipeg School of Art thinking that what he would like to be is a sign painter. He had absolutely no conception it was anything like fine art prior to going to the Winnipeg School of Art. Um, he also, so he answers to the Winnipeg School in 1946. At that point, the school was run by Lionel and Moyne Fitzgerald the great uh, Canadian landscape painter. Uh, but Fitzgerald was really not liking being, um, being a, a teacher at that, at that point. And, and in 1947, he actually left uh, Winnipeg and never returned to the school. But as a, as a first year student, Tack was never exposed to, uh, to uh, Fitzgerald's work. But in 1947, a young hotshot came, who had just recently been in New York City attending Hans Hoffman's school um, of art uh, named Joseph Plaskett uh, was in Winnipeg and he was now teaching painting at the Winnipeg School of Art. And he completely revolutionized teaching of painting in, 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 in Winnipeg in the 1940s. Um, he, he talked about people like Cezanne, he talked about people like Picasso, I mean people like Matisse, um, and, 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 and people that, that, that someone like Fitzgerald really hadn't been all that interested in. But, and, and importantly for Tack, Plaskett became a lifelong friend. He, he recognized in Tack very early that Tack had something that very few other people had, and he encouraged Tack to pursue not being a sign painter, but being a fine artist. And, Tack became, as a result of, of this encounter, I would say, with Joseph, Joseph Plaskett, a fine, a fine artist. He graduates from the school um, in 1949, and he has his first exhibition, not a solo exhibition, but a, 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 an exhibition with a number of other graduating students that year at the Hudson Bay Company in downtown Winnipeg. And, after, and since that time, to this day, he has had I think 147 exhibitions, of which 82 of them have been solo exhibitions. So he has been an extremely well exhibited artist. But he also did another thing in 1949, as in addition to having an exhibition and graduating, is he also ran an, a summer art school. A bunch of it, he and a couple of his fellow graduates decided they would run a summer art school in Gimli, Manitoba. And, he, and so that was his first teaching experience. Um, but he realized that, that teaching was not the, the, the best thing for him immediately, and someone had told him he could get a job in, um, in Banff, because there was this art school in Banff every summer um, called, called the um, you know, Banff, Banff School of Fine Arts. And so he went in the beginning in 1950, every summer from uh, 1950 to 1954, to work not as a teacher, but as a handyman. And he hung around the other artists, and he worked as a handyman. Because the reality is that, that you know, for a long time, uh, after the war, there was a great deal of prejudice against people of Japanese ancestry in this country, because they'd been the, the alien during the war. Um, but he also realized that partially because of Joe Plaskett, who he kept in contact with, that he needed further training. So he went to New York in 1951, and he, he, he wanted to take painting classes with Hans Hoffman, who was famous for, for, his, for what he called his push-pull sense of composition, which was that you know, nothing would really settle on, on the surface of the canvas. Some things went for you, and some things pulled back. But unfortunately, his painting class was completely full, so Tack had to go to a drawing class in the evening. 
But uh, the, the attack is not a person who ever sits, sits around and does nothing. So he also enrolled full time in the Brooklyn Museum of Art School, and uh, I was, uh, was uh, taught by a man named Ruben Tan. In 1952, he, after, after, he returned to Canada, and he had his first solo exhibition at the Winnipeg Art Gallery in 1952, the year I was born. Um, and um, he also returned to BC uh, to, to settle because he hadn't really lived in, living in BC since he'd been kicked out of BC in effect in, in 1944. Uh, when, he went to, when he went to Manitoba. And he, he encountered there a man named Robert Reed, um, who is a, was a, is a typographer and a printer and a designer, and, it, and began what was a very important uh, sort of uh, subcurrent within uh, tax life, which is, which, which is a designer of, of, of books and, and, uh, and sort of ads. And famously, for those of you who know anything about Vancouver, an extraordinary series of bookmarks for Duffy Books, which was a, 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 a very, very famous bookstore in, in, in Duffy's. And there's actually a very elegant book that was, that was published by the Alcuin Society, which highlights that aspect of tax career. But that's, of course, how he made his money. Because the reality is that you really couldn't make much money being an artist, and he wasn't doing any teaching at this, at this point. But he, although he'd only just barely come back to Vancouver, uh, people realized that he would, that he had he had something going for him, and in 1953, he he was he was living uh, he was sharing a space with with with, uh, with, with Robert Reed, and, and a phone call came from a man by the name of Lauren Harris, and um, he said he wanted to speak to Tack Watanabe, and Tack wasn't there, and so Tack was told by Robert Reed, you know, you should give Mr. Harris a, a call. Because Mr. Harris, as you will all know, was a, was a member of the Group Seven and was was probably sort of the figure in the art world in, in Vancouver at that time. But importantly for Tack, he was also the administrator of what was called the Emily Carr Trust and, as a consequence, the Emily Carr Scholarships. And in 1953, uh, uh, he was awarded an Emily Carr Scholarship. So I think it was only about 1500 bucks, but that allowed him to give up being a designer for a while and go to Europe, and he spent the next year and a half in Europe, uh, going to school in London at the Central uh, St. Martin School, and traveling very extensively throughout Europe, and he did a little bit of landscape work at that time, but only a very little at that time. Uh, he comes back to... Uh, to uh, North America in 1955, and on the on, on the on the boat on the way back, he meets he meets a young woman he meets a young woman by the name of Patricia Patricia White, and they fall in love, and he gets married in New York City in 1956. Uh, but he he did, he realizes that New York is not really the place for him to live, and he wants to go back to BC. So they come back to Vancouver, and he settles in Vancouver. Now, as a as a person of Japanese ancestry who was born in BC of um, a Japanese immigrant. So he's, in fact, I believe it's a, 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 it's a, it's a Nisei. He's officially what he's called. His parents are Issei, of course. Uh, he was not encouraged to learn Japanese. He was not encouraged to do anything to do with Japanese. And he knew literally nothing in his childhood about art. Art did not exist in his childhood. Um, certainly not in Seal Cove. Um, but he realized that he wasn't really sure if he was Canadian or if he was Japanese, because of course he looks Japanese. I mean, and so he decided that he really needed to find out whether or not he was Japanese or not. And so he applied to the Canada Council and got a grant, and used that grant to go to, to, to Japan. And he went to Japan in 1959, and he went with very specific uh, uh, plans in, in place. And what he was going to do in 1959 was to study calligraphy with a man named Yanagide Tayum and uh, painting with Ikuyu Hirayama. And as many of you will probably know, uh, the traditional way of teaching in Japan is that you copy things. 
So you copy older, uh, older ink paintings, you copy older pieces of calligraphy and so on. But the thing that's, that's challenging about ink paint, about Sumi painting and calligraphy is that it's a very, very unforgiving art form. Because you're working on paper and you're working uh, very quickly, otherwise the whole thing collapses and, 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 and falls to pieces. And you have to be absolutely decisive about what you're going to do. Um, Tak did reasonably well. In fact, before he left, uh, before he left Tokyo, he got a solo show in, an ex in, in a gallery in Japan. But he comes back to he comes back to, to Vancouver in 1961, realizing that he is not, in fact, Japanese. He's Canadian, and he really belongs in Canada. Um, and he, he so he comes back to Vancouver in 61, and the following year he begins to teach at the Vancouver School of Art teaching commercial art, because of course he's had this success as a, as a graphic designer. And he, he doesn't look upon that period of his life with great fondness, because the, 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 the dominant teacher at, at that time at school, the painting teacher, was a man by the name of Jack Shadbolt. And Mr. Tanabe and Mr. Shadbolt never got along. Um, and as a consequence, Tack was not terribly happy uh, working there. But he was also, he was exhibiting his work very extensively, and in 1962, he made a very important uh, sort of acquaintance, and that's when he met the gallerist Mira Godard, who at that time was working in Mont Montreal uh, for, the, for, the gal for, the, for the gallery Agnes Lafour, and um, they, have, they remained uh, friends, and, and she was his dealer until her death a few years ago, and his, the, the Mary Godard Gallery is still a tax dealer in Toronto. But the other important thing about, um, about Mary Godard is that, is that she, she had a sufficient confidence in tax work that when he goes later on to New York, which we'll get to in a minute or two, she agrees to do something rather extraordinary for him. Um, in the 1960s, he, he is, he's teaching a bit at the Vancouver School of Art, he's exhibiting, he he's even gets himself, builds himself a house, because in the 60s, a lot of artists in Vancouver had houses built for themselves. They got their architect friends to build them houses. And Tack had a friend, his name, named Bennett, who built him a house, West Van, and everything seemed to be going really well. He was married, you know, his wife was, in, was studying and so on. But he then decided this was not enough for him. It was too boring. It was too bourgeois. And so he needed to do something else with his life. And as it happened, Patricia decided she wanted to do graduate studies. And where she, got, where she wanted to do graduate studies was, was in, a, in, a, in Bryn Mawr, which is near Philadelphia. And so they decided in 1968 to move to Philadelphia. Well, Tack was in Philadelphia for like three and a half months. Before he realized that he didn't want to be in Philadelphia, and he moved to New York City. And he, 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 made, he made a go of it in New York City by sort of being, being a handyman, helping people convert their illegal lofts in, in, in Soho to studios and so on. But it was, a, it was a really tough go, and he would then commute back and forth to Bryn Mawr uh, by going anyway, to, visit, to visit his wife. But in 1970, um, he was able to persuade uh, Mirigadar to give him a stipend of $300 a month just, uh, in, 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 in advance of selling his paintings. And so he was able to stay in New York for probably a, a good two years longer than he would have otherwise stayed because uh, at the end of the year, they would sort of, you know, taught up to see whether he owed her money or she owed him money uh, because, of the, because of the sales. But the other thing that was important about this particular, this time period uh, between 1968 and, and, and 70, 72, is that he would move, he would go back and forth, back and forth from New York City to Bryn Mawr, going up through the landscape of Pennsylvania. And um, he began to think about the possibility of being a landscape painter. I say that's I, I, I say that's a very important shift in, in, in his work 
um, because if you had asked him in 1968 when he went to uh, went to New York City, what kind of painter are you? I'm an abstract painter. It would have been his answer. I'm only an abstract painter. I'm not interested in being a landscape painter. Uh, but in fact, the landscape began to grow on him. In 1972, he was going through going through the landscape, and he began to produce paintings like this. Now. This is, as you can see, these are relatively modest in scale. It's only 21 inches by 35 inches. Um, it is a, there's a, there's a very small, a small strip of sky and a large chunk of land in the, in the lower area. But one of the things you will notice immediately is there's no trace of humanity in this landscape. There's no fences, there's no houses, there's no telephone poles, there's nothing like this, and in fact, that's, that is something that TAC has always been interested in, is removing the human presence from the, from the landscape. The other thing that you will notice about this painting is it's very thinly painted. And uh, by that I mean there's not a lot of impasto or richness, richness on the surface. And TAC has always believed that it's important for there to be no trace of the artist's hands on the surface. And so he developed, he had to figure out ways to develop uh, in, in painting, which is in very, very thin coats of paint, um, which would allow him to, to have the surface be as smooth and, and as unsort of ruffled and, 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 and messy as possible. What it meant, though, was that if you had very, very extremely diluted painting, paint, is you could not paint it vertically. Because what would happen if you painted it vertically is the, the diluted paint would, would drip down the surface. So, everything you're going to see from now on, bear in mind, it was painted flat. And um, so he begins with these with, with these paintings of, Pen of Pennsylvania. Uh, there's, another, there's one other one I'm going to show you from Pennsylvania. And then, in 1972, he gets offered a summer job in Banff at the Banff School of Fine Arts. But at this time, he's teaching. He's not being handyman. He's teaching. And he decides to take it. In the meantime, his wife moves, takes a job teaching in Halifax. This is the beginning of the end of the marriage. Um, and um, <coughs> he decides to drive to Banff, which means he drives all the way across the prairies to, see, to, 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 take, to take up the position. He, had, he was incredibly successful that summer. He was, uh, people loved him as a teacher. And he, he got offered a job very quite shortly afterwards to, be, to, to, to come back to Banff to be the head of the, of, of, the, of the arts program and artist in residence at the Banff Center. And what that actually pra practically meant is he, is he would be the person that would decide who would teach what courses, he would hire the people to teach the courses, and he would live in a giant studio in, in, in Banff, which he would be able to paint it as much as he wanted to. And he didn't have to do any teaching if he didn't want to. And he didn't want to. <laughs> um, so, he, 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 he signs a contract that says, yes, I, I'll, I'll come. Back, back in 1973, when he was going to take the job. But then he had an exhibition in, um, at Mary Gallery in 1973, and it sold really, really well. And he thought, well, oh, I don't need this job in Banff. So he phoned up the man who, who, was, who, who was running Banff School and said, I don't want the job. And, 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 and he said, the gentleman said, that's all well and good, but you've signed a contract, so you're coming. So he went to Banff. And what you, what, those of you who know Banff will know that um, Banff is surrounded by extraordinary mountains, ex amazing you know, la landscape and so on. Did Taktanabe choose to paint that? No, he did not. And what he chose to paint was the prairies that he'd ri driven across in 1972. And he continued to keep driving back from, into the countryside from, from Banff. Um, and taking photographs. He'd begun to take photographs of the landscape in 1968, uh, as, as, uh, but 
Tack is now 95, so sometimes his memory is not quite as good as it would like, you would like it to be. But, but I think that I, I'm, I've seen some photographs that must be from 1968. And he would use those photographs as the basis of his of his, of his work. Now, what happens in between 1973 and him leaving Banff in 1980 is he produces an extraordinary series of paintings which deal with the landscape of particularly Alberta, the foothills and so on in Alberta. And they, they, people realized that this was a completely different way of viewing the landscape of, of this part of the world. Now this is a painting from 1973, and you'll notice if you, a lot of the titles of these things uh, have these strange codes after, after the paintings. That literally means this is the ninth painting he did in 1973. Uh, and it's very important for TAC that those, those things be in, in the title. So if you happen to have a Tanabe painting at home, don't ever tell anyone it's the land, period. It's got to be land with, with a number after it. Um, you will see it obviously looks at fields. It, it looks at, um, there might be a trace of a road of some sort in the middle. And there's obviously a lot of sky. In fact, it's basically almost half the painting is sky. Now, think about who other people who painted this part of the world. Think about people like Illingworth Kerr, or you know, Roland Gissing, or a number of other people like that. Would they have ever painted anything look even remotely like this? The answer is no. It's on the verge of abstraction. It's just barely there as a landscape, but it is still a landscape. And he begins to produce paintings in his studio in Banff, looking out at these lovely mountains, a painting <laughs> flat on, you know, on, 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 the, on the side here. Now I'm going to show you a lot of these pictures because I think they really are pretty extraordinary. Um, and you can see that occasionally they, there's, he, there's a bit of hints of photography, but what you also see is that what the paintings are really about is they're about light, they're about form, and they're about color. And how he controls those in a variety of ways is, is what, what you see throughout this. So here we see the 11th painting of 1973. And, and the paintings are getting a little bit bigger. Uh, and they will eventually get extremely big. Um, but um, this, is, this is what he was doing in his studio. Now, people thought he was crazy. Because prior to this, he'd been painting at least very vivid, interesting, and, you know, hard edge landscape, or uh, hard edge uh, abstract paintings. But people began to realize that this was a completely different way of looking at the period. And indeed, in relatively short order, as he produces the things like this, so this one's just the land, 1973, you can see there might, might be, although I don't actually think it's a building, there might be some little a tree or two there on the, on, on the left side. But one of the things that he was, able, he was doing here is he was making these incredibly thin coats of paint, and he was doing them like that. You know, it was just a quick stroke. He would, he would, he would make the, he would, he would prime the surfaces of the canvas so full, so completely that it would be as flat as possible. So that, so there would be, it would be as, as if the, 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 the paint was sort of whispered or you know blown onto the surface rather than and brushed on. But believe me, these take a long time. And in fact, he, he might often paint a painting like this where he would paint the one one the lower section and then he wouldn't go back to, to the upper section for maybe six or seven months. But as he as we decide how it would how it would be and it would, these relate to the photographs, but they obviously edit the photographs quite considerably. Now this painting is probably the, one of the first ones that, that he, he does something else that, that, that's important in this, in this body of work. Is, uh, as you can see, it's the 37th painting he did in 1974. So he was, he was, a, busy, he was a busy man in his studio in Banff. Um, but he had begun to realize that there were, there were issues with, 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 with color, uh, with keeping the, the tonality of the color correctly uh, sort of balanced. So what he does in, in this work and I think you can get some sense of it, is that he paints the, he paints the land, he, he paints the sky, and then he goes over the entire surface 
of, of the painting with an extremely thin layer of black paint. And therefore, it, it kind of unifies the whole, the whole, whole surface. And this, this happens in a great many of the paintings of this period. Now, as, I, as I've said, I mean, here we, again, we're still in 1974, the 57th painting. This one he only put, seems to put, put black on the, lower, on the lower section of the painting. But people were, were beginning to think, these are, these are really extraordinary paintings. And in fact, very shortly after he's doing paintings like this, 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 is, a, this is a relatively, you see, this is a, a very small, it's only 16 by 20. And these are basically on little scraps of canvas. And some of these are in literally, as this one says, sketch M74, are actually sketches for larger works. But in some, in other cases, they, they're, they're, they're independent works. Now, you can see this like a, a references to a, a you know, the side of a coulee here. There's a rather, a rather remarkable sky because although it looks initially that there's nothing there, the more you spend your time looking at it, there's really extraordinary a level of activity. And in 1975, he begins to talk about the foothills. And again, these are all based on photographs he's taken on these little car trips he's taken up from Banff, taking masses of photographs, and then edits them all down, and then works them on in the studio. And he, he was, uh, people realized that these were rather amazing paintings. And so, in fact, in 1976, there was an exhibition of, his, of, of, these, of these paintings, which was organized that traveled all across Canada. And, um, this was the first sort of big solo travel <coughs> show that Tackett had. Um, and, it, and it sort of put him on the map as, 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 a, as a landscape painter. But Tackett was not finished with the subject matter, as you can see. I mean, here, here you get this dramatic sort of like, presumably fields in the foreground, uh, leading up to some sort of uh, blank uh, spot in the middle that's sort of a bit of a stop. Then the, then the foothill in the background, and then this sort of shimmering sky at, at the top. Now, you can see here the paintings have grown in, scale, in size. This is the first, of the first painting in 1975. It's 46 inches by 80 inches wide. So it's a big, it's a big painting. Um, and a lot of his paintings at this time, but they have this kind of wonderful sort of indefinite kind of quality to them, but at the same time, it's, it's the landscape, it's the prairies. I mean, but it's not the prairies of someone like, like, like Robert Hurley or someone like that, which have all these, all these little, little fences and houses and all these sorts of things. Because you will not see that in Taktanavi, just as you don't see it eventually in his West Coast paintings either. Um, the land 874, 875, which, is, which obviously means he was doing it in December of 1974 and into January of 1975. Uh, again, 42 by 84 inches. So this, this is a seven foot wide painting. Now, imagine being able to take a brush across a surface that's seven feet. Now, he has a table that's about this tall. And that's when, because Tack is not a terribly tall man, so he has to be able to be, do, do this, at, you know, at, and, and you have to do it decisively, as, I, as I've indicated. Occasionally you see things like this one uh, 20, uh, from 1975, where there's a little bit more activity in the, in, in the foreground, but generally speaking, there's not a great deal of incident in these, in the, in these works. He doesn't want them to be anecdotal in any way. He wants, them to, he wants you to experience this idea of the light uh, and, and, and the form, and of course the color. A rather wonderful, I think, image of the 52nd painting of 1975. I mean, I, I, it boggles my mind sometimes when I see the, some of these numbers, that, that he is running the school, is, is, is take, make, making trips all over, all over North America to find teachers, to attract students to come to Banff, and he's still managing to produce, you know, something like 60 or 70 paintings a year. That's, that's, a, that's an extraordinary production. Plus, he was making prints at this time as well. Um, a, there's a bit, but this is a, a painting that was just, for, just offered for sale recently at Trepanier Bear and I. And they had a, they had a, they had a wonderful show of, of his work. They had four works. 
two paintings and two works on paper, and this was one of the one of the works, uh, uh, one of the paintings, and it's a pretty marvelous picture, I think, because the richness of the blue, it's not one color. There's a whole variety of uh, there's a there's a there's a uh, there's a shift in the blue that occurs, and and this sort of subtlety that you see in these paintings is something that people recognized was really an amazing sort of a, a new thing in Canadian landscape painting. Uh, Foothills from 76, 376, I mean, occasionally you see things on the horizon as you have a little, perhaps a, a haystack or something like this, you know, on the left side there, and here's a slightly more active sky and a slightly more active foreground. but. This is not, you, you, there, there are not, as, as I said, they're not anecdotal, they're, they're, they're simply, they're, they're, the incident is in, in the paint, the incident is, is in uh, what he does in terms of the composition. Now occasionally he will do things that are almost, uh, that are slightly different in format. This is an almost square format, as you can see. Um, and the foothills are just barely there, and one of the most daring things about many of these paintings is just how much sky is there. I mean, because sky is a very difficult thing to paint, and um, there are very few artists in Canadian art who have been willing to devote as much surface space in their canvases to sky as Mr. Tanabe has. Uh, foothills, 1877. Um, now, I've always wondered, I asked Tack one day whether or not these were actually roads, you know, going, in, going into these things. He said, oh, no, no, of course not. <laughs> um, and, 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 I, and I sort of said, well, I don't know that I believe that, Tack. Um, but, but nevertheless, I mean, there's a hint of perhaps a road. But the other thing that's really wonderful about this picture, I think, is this hint of some sort of mysterious light on, 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 on the horizon. I mean, is, is it the... Is it the northern lights? Is it the sunset? Is it, is it the sunrise? I mean, it's very sort of strange, something that's not quite real, and yet it's completely believable, I would argue. Um, you'll have to make that own decision for yourself. Um, another another <coughs> slightly more mountainous picture, wonderful sort of variegated sky, and, and, and here is actually quite interesting because this is one of the very few pictures of this type where there's a hint that there's clouds in the sky. Because there are parts of the hills that have got sun on them and there's parts that don't have sun on them. Now, sun is an interesting thing within Tack's career. Because Tack doesn't like really sunny landscapes. I mean, he's not, particularly, it's become very evident in all those West Coast pictures, he likes things that are misty and gray. He says it, it, it relates back to his childhood, but here you actually see something that, that happens in art, probably begin, begins, to, begins to first happen in art in the uh, 17th century when it begins to appear in much Dutch landscape paintings of, of that time period where you have clear evidence that the sun is shining through the clouds and casting shadow on, on the landscape. The thing that's sort of remarkable about this painting is this wonderful sort of quality of purple that's on the, on the edges of the, of, of, the, of the top of the hill here, the Perry Hill 677. Uh, but again, a huge painting. It's 90 inches wide and 55 inches high. So it's an extremely large, sort of, it's an embracing sort of picture in terms of, in terms of scale. Uh, slightly, slightly smaller painting uh, from, from 1977. But again, I mean, it takes real guts to be, and I, I would, and I would say it, it is, it is literally that guts to be able to be willing to devote basically three quarters of the space of your painting to an empty sky. Now here is a much more dramatic and and, and, and sort of and darker and, and darker image from 1978. Um, he's still, of course, teaching at, at Banff at this point. He's beginning to feel that, 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 that he's, he's, he's more, more or less done what he needs to do in Banff. Um, but he's still, he's still there at the time, but he's, he's producing these, these, again, you know, six feet, six feet, paintings that are six feet wide. Uh, I always think of these paintings in terms of, uh, of a, an artist that, that Tag 
admires, although he, well, he, he, he only grudgingly admits that, that he admires him, is that as, as the great English landscape painter Constable was famous for his six footers. And so there were a lot of, there were a lot of tax valley paintings that were the same uh, exact, you know, sort of a, uh, dimensions and, and, and uh, at, at, as, as Constable pictures. And then as you can see, this is six feet, six feet wide. But he, he, but he's not unafraid to do things that are that, that are not that are not expected, and so occasionally he will, he will uh, he will chop off the surface in a in a very 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 different way, and, and here you you get a completely separate sense of of the landscape. But the thing that's so wonderful about these paintings, even a, a, a vertical image like this, is that you you get in, your your mind takes 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 you the, the, the other parts of, of the of the composition. A, very, a fairly dramatic uh, sky here, and it's got much more active and, and a very sort of uh, brooding kind of quality to the land, to the land here in, in 1979. He takes, off a, he takes a year's leave of absence in 1979 um, and, and uh, leaves Banff and to try and see what he's going to do with himself. And he's, he sort of, but he continues to paint and he of course still gets to use the studio. And that's an important that's an important thing for him, um, but he's decided at the, by this point he, that he wants to return to British Columbia. Um, it's just how does he manage to do that? Um, this is probably one of the most um, dramatic skies in in, 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 in Tax Prairie pictures from, from 1979. I mean, you get a sense that there's actually a storm brewing here. And that's not something that, 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 that he did a lot of in these pictures. He does a lot of it in the West Coast pictures later on, but, but, uh, but not, not so much in the Prairie pictures. But it's still a, a, a very sort of <coughs> satisfying and, and rewarding picture because, again, it's, although initially it doesn't need to have a lot in it, it does not have a lot of narrative incident. I mean, it has a great deal of visual in incident, which is, which is certainly worth paying attention to. As does, as does a painting like this from 1980. Now, 1980 is an, an important year because that's the year he decides to leave Banff. And he decides to move back to British Columbia and settles on, on Vancouver Island. But he does not give up on, uh, on prairie paintings, even though he is no longer on the prairies or in Alberta. He continues to paint for a while. And in fact, he does something really extraordinary that year and, he, and he, he, he dramatically expands the scale of what he's, what he's doing. This is the first of the, trip, of the landscape triptychs that he produced. It actually, interestingly enough, if you want, it, you want to see it, it's in the Max Bell building at uh, the Banff Center. And, but it's the first triptych, and there's only seven landscape triptychs, and this is the first one. Now, no one that I could been able to figure out be able to find was producing landscapes of this kind of scale in Canada at that time. Not Ted Godwin, not 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 any of those. I mean, this is 18 feet wide. I mean, it is not a little picture. Um, and it wasn't a commission picture. Interestingly enough, it was a painting that that he actually he decided to make. And again, it's an example of just the sheer gutsiness of his, of, of, of his, of his, of his and, and his belief in his vision that he's, a, that he's willing to extend it to, the, to that sort of scale and it completely envelops you when you see, when you see, the, when you see the painting. A wonderful painting from 1980, I think, uh, uh, but I think this is, reminds me slightly, and I mean I'm sure Tack would, would grimace greatly if I said it in his presence, of a couple of paintings by George O'Keefe, but um, I, I, because of the way that the, way the landscape <coughs> changes, but but Tack is Tack is uh, is one of those people that if you ask him who influenced you, he say, he'll say no one. So <laughs> it, 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 it's hard to sort of like you know uh, get that out of uh, out of anyone. Now this is a, this is a, 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 a this is an example of a print that he was making at, 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 at you know at the time. And Tack had actually begun making prints as early as 1948. When he was in Winnipeg, and it's been an, an important sort of like uh, part of his career. But 
the thing that's, that's good about his prints is that um, he um, can work with other, others. And this, is, of course, is a lithograph um, which he, uh, he worked uh, with, 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 with a printer and, and the artist Mary Will, who is a friend of Tax, um, gave to the University of Lethbridge Art Gallery, which is kindly and kindly agreed to send an image through. Uh, Foothills from the 1980s again, but he's still doing this in the in the studio in Banff. But he's but his his heart is really uh, uh, moved to, um, to to be to thinking about BC. And he's he, at this point he's he's searching for a place to live, and he eventually finds a place to live on Vancouver Island. So he actually paints this picture, which was which is an extraordinary image. Uh, it was actually commissioned by one of the uh, petroleum companies in, in Calgary for their office tower. And it is, it's actually not, uh, that, that the, the caption is incorrect, it's actually a single piece of canvas. It's not, not two pieces of canvas. Um, and it's, so it's 28 inches high and it's 210 inches wide. Um, a big picture, which, which, you, which sort of, you can sort of dive into. Um, and eventually they decided when, when they were redoing their office tower that they gave it to Glenbow and Glenbow was graciously uh, sent this image along. Um, but, he, but he's painting this painting in BC when he does, when he does this. And uh, high foothills from 1983 again um, painted in BC, in BC but at the very end of these pictures, you begin to see the actual Rockies as well as, 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 as the foothills in the foreground. And one from, from uh, 1984, and these, this is really about the, the end of, the, of these pictures. Now the thing that happens, begins to happen in these very late, these very late pictures is you can see that the foreground is begins to get treated in a slightly different way with, it, with, with, with his paint, and this is one, this is one of the things he begins to move away from. Is this is this one-off execution of the surface? They're still painted flat, uh, but he but he's but but the the variations in the yellow that you see there are brush strokes. He's taken it. He's taken his acrylic paint and he's gone in with his brush, but he's made it so it's still very very flat. But again, very large painting, 45 inches by 95 inches. And I think there's one thing of Montana Butte because he, he, trapped, he's, he has been an, an extraordinarily uh, inveterate traveler. Uh, and he's gone on all kinds of uh, road trips throughout this country, the northern parts of this country, through BC, through Alberta, and he, occasionally into, in, in, into, into the United States. Um, and he is also uh, painted in, in places like Newfoundland, or take, taking photographs of Newfoundland and come back and, 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 and painted them in BC. But these paintings in 1984 are really the end of the prairie, of the prairie pictures. He really is, he's, he's, he's turning his attention, he's beginning to turn his attention to the BC landscape, to those misty uh, 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 the scenes that he loves so much. And it really is a, but again, look at this painting is 10 feet wide. It's a big picture. Um, and it, it sort of takes you in completely. And, 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 and I think the thing that's so extraordinary about this whole body of work is that although, as I say, there are no pretty little houses. There's no farmer out there in the field. There's no bird, you know, uh, picking up uh, grains of wheat from the field or anything like this. They still retain your your interest, or they certainly retain my interest, and they have been extraordinarily popular with collectors. Um, and so he, so his his dealers uh, in Vancouver and in Toronto and in Calgary have done, sold a lot of these paintings. But his attention has, moved, has shifted away from uh, the, the landscape of, of, of Alberta to the landscape of British Columbia, and that's really what he continues to paint today. Um, and I think that's about, I think that's the last, oh, no, it's almost the last slide. There's two medicine, 
River Valley paintings here. I mean, you can imagine some sort of event occurring over the horizon, but, but, but what it is, I mean, I, I would not, not speculate on. But again, look at the scale of the picture, four feet by ten feet. And that's the end of what I have to say, because BC is not what I was, what I was going to be talking about. Um, I'm, I'm talking about the, basically the pictures of, that he did in, of, of, the, of the prairie, which rightly were recognized in this exhibition, and are what really established him as one of Canada's most distinguished landscape painters. Thank you for your attention.